Hey, what's going on, on the internet? Uh, today we're going to be talking about ARM assembly. We're going to be doing a little bit of coding, and by the end of this, you should be able to write a hello world in ARM assembly that will run on any VM that you have. So let's uh, let's dive into it. So step one, right? What is assembly? Um, assembly is code that is one layer above machine code. So if you look at this example where you have a compiler that's you know, you're writing C, you're putting it in GCC. GCC at first will actually put it into assembly language here, and then it will rely upon an assembler here to bring it to machine code, right? So if you write assembly, we're writing the instructions that our computer will run eventually, but in a human readable format. Um, and in this form, it is not consumable by the computer, but it will be uh, at a certain point. We're just, we're not there yet at this point. Um, so today, like I said before, we're going to go over the ARM architecture. Um, it's a risk architecture, so that's reduced instruction set compiler, which basically means it has very few instructions. Uh, it's meant to be simple uh, and easy to, to work with. Um, ARM in particular has become increasingly popular and embedded in IoT, so there's a, a pretty good chance that the router at your house is uh, either ARM or MIPS, but mostly ARM if it's newer. Um, and in my opinion, you know, don't flame me for this, but I think ARM is way more consumable for the beginner over uh, x86, you know, Intel architecture. So ARM uh, consists of a set of registers, right? Like any other processor would. Um, registers are physical, hyper-fast memory that live inside of the processor. Um, and, you know, the registers allow us to do quick math operations inside the processor. Um, ARM is a byte addressable architecture, which means that you can ask it to pull memory from any address. It doesn't have to be four byte aligned like some architectures do, like MIPS. Um, and then ARM operates in two modes. You have ARM mode, which is the mode where instructions are four bytes long, and every you know, PC increment when you're executing uh, increments the counter by four. Or you have thumb mode on some processors where you increment by two. Um, again, this may be pretty deep for some people. If it is, don't worry about it. We're going to go into uh, some basic assembly instructions, right? So ARM instructions are written in the format an operator destination source, operator destination immediate, and immediate means like a number, like four in this example. Um, and if we get into memory operations, which again, not in this tutorial, but just to kind of put it out there, operator destination address. So look at this example, right? Really, really easy. Move, that's the operator. It says to move a value into the destination R0, the number four, right? So at the end of this example, you're gonna have the number four in register zero, right? Cool, I think this is pretty straightforward. I hope you guys are sticking with me. Um, if I'm going too fast or whatever, leave a, a comment and let me know. But uh, we're gonna get into some, some coding right now. So pull up your computer and uh, step one, if you haven't already, please run this command. Uh, this is gonna get you the ARM build chain for Intel, right? I'm assuming that you guys are working on an Intel VM you know, like a regular VM on your computer. Um, just go ahead and run that. I already have it, you'll, you'll walk through the steps, you'll hit yes, and you'll install your, your VM. Okay, so then over here on the left, we have our code. Uh, so go ahead and type this out in, I use Vim, you know, whatever, you know, Emacs, if, I guess, if you're one of those people uh, that you wanna use. Um, so let's walk through what we have here. This is the beginning template for anyone writing assembly using GCC's build chain, right? So pound, this is a, a comment, doesn't really matter what that says. Um, global start. So global start uh, allows the variable start to be accessible outside of this file and makes it an exported symbol that the rest of the build chain can touch. If that's too complicated, don't worry about it. All it means is that this start symbol is accessible. All right, we need to have that start for this code to be compilable. Uh, next, we have section text. Text is also referred to as code, right? So that means that anything south of this label is to be interpreted as code, right? And that makes sense because our start label, where the code will start, has to be in the text section. Uh, and then finally, section data, anything that is to be interpreted as data that is not executable will live in this region, right? Cool, so now that we have that all written out, let's let's write some code. Let's let's do some stuff. Let's try that, uh, that instruction we had before, right? So pretty straightforward, we're gonna do move, R0, boom, comma, pound, four. 
the pound in arm assembly means it's an immediate. Uh, so if you did four by itself, it would yell at you. You need to do pound four. Um, cool. Okay, awesome. So the way that we first save uh, and the way that we compile this into an executable blob is by doing the following, right? So we need to run the assembler. So that's going to be um, GCC, no, sorry, ARM, Linux, GNU ABI, and then we're gonna do AS. AS is the assembler. That is what's going to convert our machine code, this code over here, into, sorry, that turns our assembly over here into machine code. So the syntax for this is gonna be ARM, Linux, GNU ABI, assembler, we're going to consume what I called my 001.asm file, that's our source code, and we're gonna output 001.0. Good, no errors, awesome. So what is the .o file? The .o file is a relocatable object. This is a intermediate object that um, GCC will later consume to produce an executable elf. Right. Again, if that's too complicated, don't worry about it. Not particularly important. It's something to be aware of. Um, cool, so now we have our assembly converted to machine code, but it's not executable yet. We just need to run it through a final pass of the linker by calling um, GCC, uh, and then we'll get it to run. So we're gonna take the object file we created, and we're going to produce an elf. Damn it. Oh, I forgot one critical piece. We have to say no standard lib. If we don't say no standard lib, what will happen is the compiler is trying to include lib C in our program and we don't want it to happen because when you include lib C, um, this start gets redefined, it tries to call main, we haven't called main, it's a whole mess. So no standard lib, boom. So if we run a file on um, 001.elf, we should get a full good looking 32 bit, least significant bit elf for arm uh, with a build hash, not stripped, all that good stuff. And then to run it, um, if you haven't already, kimu app install, or sudo app install kimu. I already have it, so I'm good. And the way you run this in a non arm, you know, build environment is kimu arm our elf. Interesting, so we got a crash. Why did we get a crash? The reason we got a crash is that it, the program went to run this instruction and then everything else that's beneath it. Now it may look like there's nothing beneath it, but there is actually. If you look at the elf file, our instructions live somewhere in here, this number four, right? It tried to execute all this crap beneath it. And the reason is we didn't tell the program to properly exit. So you may be asking, right? How do you how do you make a program exit in ARM assembly? Well, that's where the uh, system call comes into play. We'll talk about that right now. So, what is a system call? When you're doing programming in user mode, which is what's happening when you're writing assembly, right? You're running a user app. You're writing a user application. Um, you need to eventually ask the kernel for help because the processor or the, the user mode process cannot end its own process. So we call this thing called a software interrupt to ask the kernel to take some kind of action, right? And in ARM architecture, R7, register seven, you know, the value that is stored there determines what we do. That's called the system call number. And then R0 through R4 determines how we perform that action, right? So for example, like we were talking about before, we wanted to perform an exit, okay. How do we perform an exit using this? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back into our coding environment and we're gonna Google, I already have it pulled up but I'll show you guys how to get here, right? ARM32 system call table. And then luckily Chromium OS uh, has documented this for us. You can find a whole bunch of these everywhere. But you have this system call table for Linux and you're gonna wanna go to the ARM32 bit version. So we have all of the services the kernel is able to offer our program, right? So for this case, we want to run the exit system call. How do we do that? Well, we put the number one into R7, 
the error code we want to return. So our process will return this value into R0. And then we call the software interrupt instruction. So let's do that. So we said R7 had to have, sorry, what did I say? R7 should have one. Yes, R7 should have one. And then in this case, let's just return, I don't know, let's return 13. This is, so this notation up here is hexadecimal, this is decimal. And then we do software interrupt zero. We recompile our program, so we assemble using AS, our, our assembly into machine code. Then we compile into an ELF using GCC, and then we try to run it. Awesome, so we ran the program, it didn't crash, and what was the return value? 13, perfectly, right? So the program worked exactly as we expected. Um, cool, so well, what have we done? We've, we've written some ARM assembly that did something we expected it to, and then it didn't crash. Well, I promise you guys, at the end of this, we'll be able to write a hello world. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna satisfy that promise. There are a few more things we have to do first. So how do you write to the screen? Okay, we did an exit before, what, what is the write process? Okay, well, I said that the kernel probably has to take care of this using some kind of kernel service. Oh, well, there's a write. Okay, how do we write to the screen? In Linux, there are three system, or sorry, three file descriptors by default. There's standard in, which is file descriptor zero, standard out, which is file descriptor one, and standard error, file descriptor two. So what we're gonna end up doing is we are going to write a string to the standard out file descriptor. Okay, and how do we do that? Well, let's ask the system call table. We need to set R7 to four. We need to set R0 to the file descriptor we're gonna write to, which is one. We're gonna set R1 to the data we're going to write to the screen, and then R2 to the length of that data. We're adding a few more arguments now, so instead of just the R0 before, we have R0, R0, R1, R1, and R2. A little more complicated, really not that bad. All right, so what do we say we're gonna do? The system call is now system call four. R0 is now the file descriptor, file descriptor one. Uh, we have to set R1 to something, right? Okay, what is that something? The something is the data we're gonna output to the screen. Let's define that data in the data section. That makes a lot of sense, right? The message, so this is a label. We're calling the message we're gonna write message, and it is of type ASCII, and it's hello world with a new line at the end. Cool, so what does that do? We've told the assembler, hey, in your data section, there is an ASCII string of this value that we're gonna to refer to as a message. We're gonna introduce a new instruction called load register. And what this is doing is when you're dealing with memory operations and because we're loading the memory address of a location, we have to use this syntax. So we're saying load into register one, the address of the message label. Pretty cool, right? And then finally we move into R2, the length of the string. So how long is this? We have 5, 10, 11, 12, 13. And then invoke the, the interrupt. Okay, great. Interesting. So we assembled our assembly into machine code. We compiled it to a runnable ELF. We ran the ELF and we got our data, but we got a crash. Why is that? Same problem as before, we failed to exit. So we're gonna rewrite the exit shell code. And we'll return uh, 65. 65 is a very funny number in the embedded world. We'll get into that in a different video. Save our code. Reassemble, hello world, prints a new line, no crash. There you go guys, I hope you had fun here, I hope you learned something. 
Um, if you did, drop a comment. Give me an idea of what you want to learn in the next video. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, keep learning. Thanks.